Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so my name is Colleen Doherty. I'm an assistant director uh, in the Center for Research and Fellowships. Um, this is our first year collaborating with the Laidlaw Foundation partners to select 25 outstanding undergraduates for the Laidlaw Undergraduate Leadership and Research Scholarship. Our first cohort is composed of talented and motivated students who were eager to conduct meaningful research in their academic area of interest. These fellows pursued a mentored, ind independent mentored six week research project this past summer and are enjoying the benefits of a leadership development training program currently this academic year. Next summer, our students will undertake a six week long leadership in action projects that encompass their work as Laidlaw scholars, um, all while also engaging in a global network of Laidlaw scholars with other partner institutions around the world. Today, you will hear from four of our inaugural fellows, and I will facilitate questions from our, uh, from our audience and from our audience on Zoom uh, after their presentations. Our four fellows are Renee Clark, Damie Kim, Cade Spencer, and Kumal Zaidi. Renee will present first. Good morning, folks. Today I'm going to present um, the research that I did over the summer, um, sort of on the socio-political role of churches. Um, my research kind of lies at the nexus of political theory and theology, so with that, that kind of um, affected my methodology as well, which I'll get into. Um, I'd like to also uh, thank my advisor in the project, um, Dr. Hartman, who spent many, many hours talking me through this um, project and helping me with some of that methodology. Um, so kind of here's our order of events on this uh, little presentation for today. So um, basically I want to talk about social withdrawal in Appalachia, which is the region from which I hail, um, and sort of how I got interested in this socio-political role, um, and how I sort of got interested in this socio-political role of churches. Then I'll go into the theoretical framework, which is really the bulk of um, the political theory scholarship of this project, um, of sort of uh, reading and interpreting various works of political theory and then applying them um, to then this context. Then I'll go into sort of two um, examples of that framework playing out that I found throughout my research. So um, just to kind of situate um, Appalachia today, um, we have a lot of social science data that shows that sort of folks in rural communities are more isolated today than they have been previously. They're more conditioned. Um, to technology that is sort of living in a, a more virtual setting as opposed to um, a physical setting, um, which in and of itself uh, to be sort of online very much is not an issue, but then uh, the issue that then comes with it is um, there's a correlation within folks being less empathetic, le having fewer community ties as well, which has um, serious effects um, not only on social communities but also on the political communities um, that folks are a part of. So um, my research then to explore sort of a theoretical framework for how churches um, can sort of combat social isolation and social withdrawal, um, I use the case study of predominantly black churches in American history, um, which have played a very significant role in shaping social and political movements in our country. Um, the work of Dr. Henry Louis Gates, um, he recently um, published a book called The Black Church, This Is Our Story, This Is Our Song. In the opening sentence of that work um, is what you see before you. No pillar of the African-American community has been more central to its history, identity, and social justice vision than the black church. Um, what I'll hope to sort of argue to you in this presentation is that what we believe very much shapes what we do. Um, and that's sort of how um, this theoretical framework comes about. So churches historically and currently can provide a social scaffolding. Uh, they sort of provide an occasion for us to gather together. Um, there I explored the work of um, Dr. Uh, Evelyn Higginbotham in her book Righteous Discontent, which looks at the social and political role of the Southern Baptist Convention, um, particularly uh, through the period of the 1880s to the 1920s. When she's talking about the churches, she uses this term uh, public sphere. And so churches, um, for Higginbotham, um, mediate uh, between private citizens and the, and the state um, an arena for rational formation and functioning information, in other words, public opinion. 
Um, so how we gather together and believe then shapes um, what we think about our social settings. So this is kind of the theoretical model um, that I sort of worked through this summer. So basically, the church organizes fellowship, provides that occasion for um, social interaction, and then through various practices of faith, um, like volunteerism and charity, that ethic then provides a framework for social mobilization. Um, and so sort of with that, one of the, the serious complications, but also um, how you get slightly different outcomes from that political mobilization, is the interpretation of faith. So how, you, how your belief changes in a given setting actually informs the actions that you undertake. So theology informs ethic. So sort of one example of this that I saw pretty heavily in my research was um, the women's social role through the Southern Baptist Church in the 1880s. So um, at this time, the dominant theology was, um, was that of uh, complementarianism, that sort of men and women had biologically and socially distinct roles and that women, um, in order to be proper adherents to Christian faith, had to play a subservient social role to men. Women within the Southern Baptist Convention sort of rejected this theology and formed reading groups that then turned into schools that then educated women um, throughout the South um, and really played a then sizable social impact in how the Southern Baptist Convention um, formed its church organization, its church structure, and then its political lobbying efforts um, following that. So again, the church organizes this fellowship. The church is organizing these women's reading groups. But then, through the practice of their faith, they're creating free clinics, they're creating schools, they're creating just occasions to um, improve the communities in which they live, and then that had the social and political effect of various lobbying efforts later in the century, and also the social effect of creating schools, which played such a significant role um, in the 20th century. Um, then I looked at the work of Howard Thurman, who is a, a very um, important theologian, and I think one that um, is beginning to sort of get more, um, he's beginning to be discussed, I think, a lot more. Um, Howard Thurman is sort of known as um, the, almost like the mystic of the civil rights movement. That's sort of like the tagline that gets used a lot with um, Howard Thurman. Um, very close friend and confidant of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and really it's his theology that comes before King that so informs how we then see the civil rights movement um, play out in a pluralistic setting, in a religiously pluralistic setting. And that's really because um, Howard Thurman in the 1920s and 30s goes to San Francisco and creates an interracial, interfaith church. In this church um, in San Francisco, you know, there's um, a statue of the Buddha next to a cross. You have this space so early on where it is not only acceptable but celebrated to have a religiously pluralistic setting. That then has huge implications for the civil rights movement, which of course we know um, one of the real strengths of it was its religious pluralism, the ability to leverage various religious movements in our country to all one goal of that civil rights movement. So as he sort of understood the church, um, it's important uh, that we have this fellowship because it fosters understanding amongst um, one another. So understanding and confidence rather than distrust, prejudice, and strife. And that's really why um, belief systems matter so much to how we act politically. So again, that theoretical framework, he's organizing folks to volunteer in the San Francisco community. He's organizing charitable efforts. Um, and also then those charitable efforts later in the 1950s and 60s really then um, were able to galvanize uh, the, the political arm of, this, of the civil rights movement. Um, and so this kind of theoretical framework, like I said, this is really the bulk of the research. A lot of it is developed um, from the political theory work um, of Alexei de Tocqueville, um, sort of the 19th century um, French aristocrat that came to America and sort of observed different social characteristics um, in sort of a more obscure uh, work of his called Memoir on Pauperism, he really talks about this um, capability of the church to organize fellowship for then charity and volunteerism. And that's kind of how I developed um, the framework from that. But that is all I have um, for today to kind of talk about that research. And I'm hoping to, in the next summer, um, apply this research to conduct field work um, in 
uh, West Virginia and sort of look at church social roles there. Thank you very much, Renee. Um, next up, we'll have Dean Kim. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here with us today this morning. My name is Damie Kim, and I'm a junior in the Georgetown College studying history and philosophy and minoring classics. And my primary area of academic interest is the history of slavery in the US. This summer, I had the opportunity to work with the Laidlaw Fellowship to create the Frederick Douglass Anthology, which is a collection of his most prominent works online. It's a website, so you'll be able to see the link at the end of my presentation. Before I begin, I just want to give a thank you to Professor Adam Rothman sitting over here uh, for all his patience and guidance and gracious mentorship. So first, I want to provide a little bit of context on how and why I decided to pursue this project. Um, I studied Frederick Douglass. Um, I wrote a research paper on him in high school. And I recognize that there are so many works of his, and there isn't really a cohesive and accessible way for high school students to access his work. And so in a typical US history classroom, for example, Students would have maybe one or two classes dedicated to studying Douglas, reading his first autobiography, The Narrative, which you might be familiar with, as well as his Fourth of July speech. And so I recognize that you know, there's not much time to be able to dedicate it to Frederick Douglass. And so I wanted to create a, an option for educators to be able to use his work for research and writing for their students. And so that was my target audience. And I was actually inspired by Bedford Readers, which some of you might be familiar with. They're very, very short books um, with an introduction, and it's a collection of maybe 30, 40 primary sources. So that was sort of the model I was looking at as I created my anthology. So this is actually a screenshot from my website, and I provide a timeline with important dates and important events, and if you scroll through, there's much more. Going into this project, I recognized that it was a very different type of research than I have ever done and than my peers were doing, um, since it wasn't you know, in a lab or creating or doing field work to create research. And so I wanted to go in with a critical lens. And some of the biggest difficulties were selecting which sources to use, as well as editing the sources themselves to really highlight the key themes in Douglas's life. And so these were some of my guiding questions. And um, they proved effective, I think, in doing my research. And this is a table of contents. So this is where um, there are links to all the pages with the actual um, sources that I chose and edited. And again, you can see more below. There's, I separated them into pre-Civil War and post-Civil War era sources. So when conducting my research and creating my project, I had to heavily rely on the historians who have come before me who have studied Frederick Douglass, which I owe them a lot um, to, for example, Philip Boner, Eric Boner, Henry Louis Gates, David Blight, for sure. And um, I referenced them not only to identify what might be considered the canon of Douglass's sources, um, such as the narrative or the 4th of July speech, um, but I also use them to um, provide background using the narratives that they construct about Douglas's life and his time as well. And so my process really looked like relying on those secondary sources, gathering my background research, and then identifying the sources that I wanted to use, editing them down to max two pages on what would be like a Word document, um, and then creating headnotes to provide context, and also creating a timeline, and bibliography, of course. So this is what would be the key aspects of my website. Um, this was the first one on the table of contents. So I would provide the title, 
the context locationally and historically. And then the yellow part is um, the sort of summary that you can look at before going into reading the actual source that I've edited down. So as I mentioned before, I wanted to create a framework with themes and questions that students who may actually be using my resource can look to. And you may be familiar with writing research papers. And the most difficult part really is choosing what you want to talk about. And so these are really only guidelines. But um, I kind of discussed this in my introduction. And sorry, I got distracted. Uh, in my introduction, and so I provide three different um, chronological themes, and so Frederick Douglass talks about his time in slavery, especially in the very beginnings of his abolitionist career, and he discusses the violence inflicted upon slaves and their methods of survival and resistance as well, and as he sort of came into his role as this prominent black figure as a um, champion of slaves and freedmen's rights, he used his voice and his pen to persuade, borrowing from Christian ideals as well as American um, values. And even after the Civil War, after emancipation, and as the country entered the Reconstruction era, he was very actively involved in other areas of politics as well as um, for the black people. And so he discussed women's suffrage, immigration, and of course racial prejudice manifested in lynchings and um, other ways. And so I also wanted to include that, um, I have to thank Professor Rothman once again for um, his incredible Twitter base, which I did not know about. Um, I did not know that the world of historian Twitter existed. And his post about my project gathered some attention and positive feedback from um, colleagues and educators. And so I have now entered this world. I am very unfamiliar with it, but I'll make my way through it. And also, I have been trying to reach out to educators and institutions I know so that I can have my um, website in circulation and application. That is my greater goal. Um, and so in the panel's discussion afterwards, I would also love to hear if you have any thoughts on how I can disseminate it further. Uh, I would love to be involved in creating the curriculum and kind of getting feedback from educators as well. So thank you. And here is my website. If you want to take a little photo and scroll through it, I'm proud of it. So I hope you enjoy. And you can't quite see it. But please feel free to email me with any questions or advice on uh, my project. It's my net ID. You can find me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. Next up, we'll hear from Kate Spencer. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, let me just get all situated. Okay. Hope you all are having a good day. There we go. OK, awesome. Um, hello, my name is Kate Spencer. I am a sophomore in the college studying Gov in English. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm so excited to present today. So today, I'll be presenting on the dyslexia crisis, policy recommendations for the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. Here's a little table of contents, kind of what we're going to be covering today. I'm going to be looking at acknowledgment, dyslexia crisis, research context, discussion, continued care, and a thank you. But I want to start by giving the much-deserved acknowledgments. I want to start by thanking uh, the Laidlaw Foundation at large for the funding um, and justice support in this process. Thanking Colleen, uh, who is our awesome CRF advisor and who really helped make the Laidlaw uh, process possible for all of us. I want to thank my amazing advisor, Dr. Andrea Whistler, who's in the room. Um, she works at the CSJ. She is just incredible and really made this process so fruitful for me. Um, and I want to thank my friends that are here in the room and my late law peers. Um, Y'all mean so much to me. I'm so glad we got to do this collaboratively together. Uh, it was such a fun and great process. And going into the dyslexia crisis. 
Um, so when I was kind of flipping through, looking at Google, kind of what should I research, um, I always knew I kind of wanted to focus on education policy, started at the big umbrella, got a little more specific, knew I wanted to look at specifically dyslexia. Um, so that led me to the dyslexia crisis. Uh, now this is a term coined by um, dyslexic, dyslexic Advantage and Impact Dyslexia, which are two organizations that do dyslexia lobbying here. Um, and uh, really, it is not a term that's meant to cause fear or anything like that. It's really just something that it's supposed to call us into urgency to act and really go forward and research with dyslexia. Um, dyslexia is the most common learning disability in our country, um, and it's something that deserves a lot more um, time and research invested into it. And today I'm gonna explore one little avenue and get, I'm responding to this call for action and I'm hoping to do uh, my steps that I can um, in this process. So a little stat here at the bottom, which really kind of got me on this thought process, is that 48% of individuals in the Texas criminal justice system were estimated to be qualified for dyslexia diagnosis. Um, just general population, it's about 20% of the general population has dyslexia. So obviously 48% is a huge jump in this specific community, um, and it deserves attention. As you'll note, the study was in 2000. Um, there's not been a lot of other literature following this, which again, I will touch on later as a further call to action. Okay, so research context. Um, I believe I have a slide for it, awesome. So why dyslexia, why Texas, and kind of what got me on this track? Um, so I'm actually from Texas. I did my whole public education experience there, and I have dyslexia. So it, that was such a rich experience because coming into this research, I, you know, I was you know swimming in laws about dyslexia, but I actually know how they manifest to the most individual level. Um, I know these laws, and it was so empowering for me um, to be able to study these laws. Now, having done all the public education system with these dyslexia care, now being a scholar able to look at these laws was just so empowering. Um, it just felt incredible, and so I'm so grateful for this opportunity, and it felt great to know kind of how these laws actually look when they are put into action. Um, but we'll see here, so that's why I chose Texas. But Texas actually has something going for them because they were the first state in our nation to pass a specific dyslexia law. Um, it was in 1985, um, and that was the first law specifically addressing dyslexia in the state level in our country. Um, and their law, that specifically was about uh, universal screening for dyslexia, which is a concept I'll get in more a little later. Um, but yeah, shout out Texas for that. Um, and then, so they have done a huge bank of dyslexia specific law since then. There's about 12 um, specific education codes that speak directly to dyslexia, which is pretty, pretty major. Um, and when I, my, so research question for this project was, what can be identified as the key characteristics and priorities of the Texas dyslexia academic codes? Um, and how might these findings by these characteristics uh, support the formation of dyslexia policy for the Texas juvenile justice system? Um, so I was really looking to get a, create a full literature review synthesis of all of the existing dyslexia policy in Texas, what are the main priorities and characteristics, and then see, okay, as we're growing from the policy here, as we're growing from this foundation, what are the things we should prioritize going forward? And that's specifically through the lens of the juvenile justice community um, in Texas. Okay, so I'm gonna go into the four key priority and characteristics I found, um, and two areas of academic uh, recommended policy growth. I wanna shout out the Texas Education Association. Um, they were my biggest collaborator in this process. Um, not directly, but they have so many great resources online. They have a whole 200 page um, Texas Dyslexia Handbook, which was just incredible. A very great read if you have time on a Saturday. Um, I totally recommend it. Uh, but it was, it was pretty engaging and exciting to see all the structures that helped me when I was a kid, so that was pretty cool. Um, so let's get into it. So the four policy priorities of Texas Dyslexia Law so again, I was actually looking at the policies themselves. I was looking at the scholarship of the Texas Education Association, and then um, the Texas State Senate in-house had actually had two um, commissioned research teams before that did dyslexia policy research in Texas. Um, so I also looked at their findings. And I synthesized all of that into four main priorities, uh, and we're gonna go over them real quick. So the first one is early universal screening. This by far is the biggest uh, through line in dyslexia policy in Texas. Um, early universal screening is definitely their go-to policy. Um, and that has a lot of reasons. It's because, you know, dyslexia care, the most transformative stages are at early education, so therefore it's best to make sure care is implemented from day one. Um, so early universal screening is basically, this is not a diagnostic tool, it's more labeling kids who may be at risk for dyslexia diagnosis. That's the language they use. And later on, we'll talk about, okay, when does formal diagnosis come in? Um, so if you get screening, that can only tell you that you're at risk. It's not telling you you have dyslexia or are diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, but that's a really important tool for us to get uh, qualitative or quantitative numbers of um, this is like 
dyslexia population in our school communities. I'm going to list the two laws that really speak to this, uh, Texas Education Code 228 and Texas Education 38.03. Um, these both really speak to universal screening, and they're some of Texas' biggest laws, um, and are still really influential as far as dyslexia policy across the nation. Uh, second was formal evaluation identification. So this is moving on from screening. This is if you've been screened for at risk of dyslexia, then you can get formally diagnosed. Um, and this is also a huge priority of Texas dyslexia law. Um, but I would still say universal screening is definitely the most developed. Um, and there's a lot of interest and scholarship there. Third is evidence-based instruction and administrative support. Um, Texas really emphasizes uh, evidence-based instruction. So really coming at dyslexia care the best frameworks and most effective frameworks possible, um, which I think is really important. And then it also emphasizes administrative support, which is a very, I think, important component. Um, so it's about keeping ongoing education for teachers. It's about having teachers that are certified in the room, um, having aides, and constantly making sure that this evidence-based instruction is updated and that everyone is ready to have the most effective instruction possible. Um, and this, a lot of this uh, scholarship for this third point came from the Dyslexia Handbook, the 2018 update. Um, this Lexi Handbook is great. It's been updated since 1985, so it's something they approved, that's approved in the state legislature um, as an update through the TA. And then the last one, and personally one of my favorites, and one of the most kind of scholarship areas I engage with the most, is support system development. Um, and what support system development looks at is it's really looking at the social and emotional needs of students with dyslexia. Um, it's recognizing that this, having dyslexia in the education system can cause additional stresses, um, can cause additional obstacles, that students really need a support system around them. Um, some of my favorite laws, which are actually laws as far as, I know it might be weird to have a favorite law, but um, as far as the dyslexia policy here, is there are actually policies about parents and how parents should be educated um, when a student is screened for or diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, so parents are legally, um, or guardians are legally required to be part of the process and get um, education materials on what dyslexia means, what this looks like for their child. I think that is really great in building a support system from day one. Um, and also, of course, it calls in teachers, it calls in peers, and a lot of great assistance there. Um, so I'm hoping this is a field, and I'll talk more on later, I think can really use more growth as far as social and emotional frameworks and other social justice uh, lenses there. And one helpful document for that was the Texas State Dyslexia Requirements Worksheet. Uh, it was great. Okay, so two areas of policy growth. So again, that, what I just went over, were four policy priorities I see as the Sexia policy in Texas at large. Um, so I really wanted to get a strong foundation of what was I, what was I working with, what has been already established. And then from there, uh, we can recognize that there is not, there's actually none really specific policy right now for the Texas juvenile system. Um, so we can recognize that early education is super important as far as the Sexia care, and yet we're not seeing specific policies for these juvenile programs. And in there, there's kind of a discrepancy. Um, we really need to have um, policies that speak specific to this community of students. Um, and so I'm going to say two areas that I think are the best areas for us to kind of go forward in making dyslexia policy specifically for the juvenile justice community. Um, the first one is going to be compensatory services. Um, so what this means is, I obviously you know the word compensation, but it's looking for students who did not get the early universal screening policies that were in place. Um, even though universal screening is a law, there are districts that do not implement it. Um, so it's really important that kids uh, or students, when they are later in life, may have never properly gotten screened or diagnosed for dyslexia, and Common Storage Services seeks to step in and get that care and training later. Um, so this would be more aimed towards your 12, 13 age demographic. Um, so I really like this. There are frameworks right now in place that we can use to kind of guide our scholarship here. Uh, for example, Texas in the traditional classroom has um, strategies for a universal screening at seventh grade, um, which could be possibly um, adjusted to this framework, but community services are great. Um, they really look at building dyslexia care for older individuals, um, which is a very important area of policy growth. The second one is support system development. Again, I touched on this earlier, but I think there's a lot of, um, there's developing scholarship on support systems that needs to be done specifically in the juvenile justice communities. Um, these, you know, the classroom environments in the juvenile justice system are different from the traditional classroom, and there has to be increased social and emotional support and other social justice lenses included here to make sure that everyone is getting the best support system um, they can. Uh, I think I'm on time, um, but I'll just end quickly. Uh, continued care, my biggest takeaway from this is just we uh, need to set forward more research on dyslexia and more just care and energy into this community, and I'm so excited to be doing that. Um, I'm continuing my research with a fellowship with the National Center for Learning Disabilities for the next year, so I will be continuing my work with this and I'm so excited and so grateful for Laidlaw for giving me the jump. Um, thank you to my family at home for watching. Um, that's it. Thanks, guys.
Thank you, Kate. And next, uh, Kamal Zaidi. Good morning, everyone, or I guess closer to afternoon now, but I'm Kumel Zaidi. I'm a junior in the SFS, majoring in culture and politics, and my research is on Afghan refugee resettlement in the context of the United States. It was an issue that I thought about a lot personally because my family was hosting an Afghan refugee family uh, during the time when I was conducting the research. And as someone who had immigrated from Pakistan, it was an issue that was, you know, proximate to me, something I cared about and wanted to invest in. But before I get started on the exact nitty gritty of my research, I wanted to say a few thank yous. First of all, to the Laid Law Program, Colleen and Bill for making all of this possible. Also to the CSJ and Dr. Whistler for making the conference possible, as well as all of my peers who are here presenting or watching for being a supportive network whether it was you know, working for long hours at Foxtrot, getting coffee, or waging a prank war against Renee and her roommates by night. I think it was all very important to the research and the environment. Uh, I also want to thank D uh, Professor Brian McCabe for facilitating both my interest in urban studies from his class on gentrification, uh, as well as helping my broader research process. And finally, I want to have one little shout out or thank you to my roommate for lending me this suit, without which I would be woefully underdressed right now. All right, so a quick outline. We're going to go through five things here. First, Afghan resettlement, an overview of some of the history or important tidbits that you need to know to make my project and its context make sense. Second, I want to put that history of Afghan refugee resettlement and conflict in the context of the racialized politics of urban development in the United States. Third, looking at national resettlement agencies. There are nine national resettlement agencies in the United States that are conducting resettlement, and that was the primary kind of base that my uh, research was looking at. Then we'll talk about my research framework and finally results. So Afghan refugee resettlement, the main event that uh, is important for this is the uh, 2021 Taliban offensive that caused the fall of Kabul. Uh, in response to this, there was a vast influx, influx of Afghan refugees who had been displaced coming into the United States, but also all across the globe. It required us to drastically change both our refugee policies and also make serious considerations about who we're letting in, how we're letting them in, etc. And while a lot of the focus ends up being on the policy aspect, you know, this numerical game of how many refugees we brought in, there are also a lot of issues for the refugees themselves in terms of getting the resources that they needed to fully integrate into the cities, areas, neighborhoods that they were being placed into. So Afghans can enter uh, the United States under SIVs, which are special immigrant visas, uh, temporary permanent status as parolees. I put an asterisk there because most recently, a couple of days ago, that was actually changed under the Biden administration or asylees. The reasons why these distinctions are important is because the quality and quantity of care that one receives as a refugee are dependent on which of these categories you're identified as. So one of the significant disparities that I noticed was that SIVs, special immigrant visas, were often given to folks who can work as translators. Uh, however, parolees are often those who aren't able to speak English. And parolees are often those who also don't get as many resources in terms of education, literacy training, integration, all of those things. So we have a situation where a lot of resources are getting funneled into refugees who can help the United States as translators, but not as much onto those who uh, like need the assistance to be integrated in a meaningful way into the communities that they're being placed into. So there are a lot of barriers to resettlement that I already mentioned earlier, linguistic cultural assimilation being one of them, uh, the uh, ESL classes, especially for children, uh, access to resources and information. There are a lot of basic things that we would take for granted, but for example, job and resume assistance, budgeting information, where to go to get your groceries, all things that, you know, when we are in a neighborhood, we know, hey, I don't, you can go to like a Publix or that's a Floridian me, I guess the safe way, um, to get your groceries, but a refugee might not necessarily know. Uh, denial of parole cases, how to deal with that, visa delays, healthcare, et cetera. 
So I think this picture mostly highlights the complexity of the process. Uh, you don't need to look at any of the specific things really because it is very confusing. And I mostly put it up there to confuse everyone more because I think it very much is the situation that refugees are in where you come to the United States, you presume it's gonna be kind of a smooth process where someone is gonna lead you through each individual step, but um, most of that process is done, ha has to be done on their own, which creates substantial issues for them. So in terms of the racial politics of urban development, uh, American urban development is stratified along uh, racial and class lines. One of the key scholars that talks about this is David Harvey. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but uh, what his, the premise of his argument is, is about this idea of the right to the city. Who has the right to the city and how can that be delimited by certain politics? The National Resettlement Agencies, the Department of State contracts nine of them to be able to settle refugees through the Re uh, Reception and Placement Program, RMP, which provides a one-time payment per refugee during the refugee's first three months. This is actually one of the things that causes the most issues for refugees because National Resettlement Agencies are pretty much only responsible for them for those three months, 90 days, but then after that, they are gone outside of the refugee's life, which provides a lot of issues for them, especially since, I mean, English is one of the most difficult languages to learn, so three months for someone who doesn't know how to speak English, obviously not gonna work out. Uh, there's a list of the nine refugee resettlement agencies below. I wasn't able to get in contact with all of them for my research because some of them are very hard to get a hold of and often don't reply to emails at all. Uh, however, some of the ones that I did talk to are the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, ECDC, the Ethiopian Community Development Council, and Church World Service, as well as the uh, Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services. So in terms of my research framework, I conducted a phenomenological study centered around creating a collage of experiences of refugees themselves, caseworkers, volunteers, and agency executives. Those different perspectives were essential to my research because I was very much looking at the differences between how higher ups or executives would portray the smoothness or not smoothness of the integration process versus how refugees themselves had experienced it. And one thing that I'd found as I was going along my research is a difference between volunteers and caseworkers, where caseworkers were often those who didn't really have an obligation to refugees after you know, the 90 day period gone up, but volunteers were quite literally taking unpaid time to work on cases that were left behind by caseworkers in a lot of cases. So they were a crucial part of uh, the interview process for me since they gave an indispensable you know, wealth of knowledge on uh, the refugee integration process that doesn't really get talked about. So I conducted nine semi-structured interviews ranging from 30 minutes to an hour and then followed up with uh, the individuals I'd interviewed to talk about, you know, the thematic consistencies between uh, what they had discussed. And the central question was, in what ways is Afghan refugee resettlement undermined by the bureaucratic and or organizational structure of national resettlement agencies? So in terms of the results, there were three thematic elements I identified. First was ignorance and negligence. So both the kind of dyad of being ignored and also not being given the resources as a refugee, resource disparity and in, uh, investment. So, you know, that what I discussed earlier between SIVs versus parolees, some getting massive amounts of investment versus others having uh, no investment at all and, in fact, disparity. And also, this uh, related is this idea of trust and investment from the refugees' angle. Do they trust the caseworkers that they're talking to? Do they trust the volunteers and the community? And how does that play out? So I wanted to talk about some relevant stories uh, from refugees that I had talked to. Uh, so for example, some of the refugees, uh, one of the stories that they had described to me was uh, one of them who had moved to the United States, had healthcare issues with his wife, and the caseworkers pretty much did not provide any information for how to get to doctors, resources, what to do to provide care. I think that is a direct example of how, uh, you know, some refugees were not able to get access to the necessary means of quite literally paying for healthcare, which is 
something that they should most definitely be able to have access to. Other issues from volunteers that I had talked to, one volunteer described stories of a uh, particular landlord who was taking refugees in for three months and uh, kicking them out after one month, but keeping all three months of their rent. And this was something that you know the national resettlement agencies were not aware of, or maybe might have been aware of, but didn't really you know uh, bring to the surface because there was a lack of regulatory checks on uh, you know the the individuals that are uh, giving refugees housing. So there are a lot of issues uh, similar to that in terms of housing, who gets access to it, or even the regulatory checks on how housing is regulated that were central to my research and demonstrated the substantial disparity between the care refugees were receiving and what was deserved. So my research is still ongoing now. I'm working on conducting more interviews, but that's what I got for you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So we are going to invite our Law Scholars back up to for our Q&A um, while we get our Zoom set up. Uh, thank you again to Renee Clark, Jamie Kim, Kate Spencer, and Kamal Zaidi. So we have about 15-ish, a few, we have a few minutes um, for questions for our laid law scholars. Um, for those here in the room, if you'll raise your hand um, and the mic will come, come to you. Um, and for those on Zoom, uh, if you would please put your questions in the chat uh, and then they'll be asked here. So, do we have our first question for our wonderful laid law scholars? Yes. To all of you, first of all, uh, really compelling research. So thank you so much for the work that you did. I actually wanted to say to you, Damie, that um, I have a, a recommendation for an organization that I think could be really helpful in the continuation of your work. It's called Teaching for Change. And I don't know if in your research you encountered it. They run the Zinn Education Research Project based on the work of Howard Zinn, People's History of the United States and, and all the others. So I highly recommend uh, that you look them up, and if you have interest, you and I can follow up separately. They're based here in D.C. Um, but I want to thank you for really centering such an important historical figure um, and doing it in such a way with compassion and really seeing the need for educating at, at an earlier stage, right? Many of you come to college and for the first time are hearing about so many of the things you studied, but what you showed us today is that we need to start this education earlier. So I just wanted to acknowledge and thank you, Jamie, and, um, and I hope that you get to continue this work because it seems like you really care about it and love it. Um, and to Cade, your energy is so wonderful. Um, I hope you will keep loving laws. Um, and if you want to go to law school, I'd love to talk to you more. Um, and thank you so much for talking about disability research. Um, and for you that, um, I'm forgetting your name, I'm sorry, uh, uh, talked about Appalachia, I wanted to tell you there is a whole body of research that I'd love to introduce you to in the sociology literature that really does focus on it, not only across class uh, considerations, but also across race and geography, um, similar to Brian McCabe's research. Um, so I would love to talk to you as well. And your research on Afghan refugees is so urgent that I really hope that you will take that and do something with it beyond this study. Um, it seems like you're very passionate about it, and I just want to acknowledge that the timeliness of your work is so critical, and I can see you going really far with it, perhaps with a PhD. So just congratulations to all of you. So impressive, and can't wait to see what comes out of it. Thank you. <laughs> I was also very excited about it. Yes.
Hello, um, I have a question for Cade. Uh, first of all, to echo uh, what Dr. Prescaro said, I really enjoyed your presentation and focus on uh, disability law in Texas. Um, one thing I'm interested in is that it seems like specific to policy, a lot of understanding around disability kind of relies on a diagnosis. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about I don't know, any ideas you have or maybe recommendations you've thought of of uh, people receiving that sort of support that is independent of a diagnosis? And because I feel like diagnoses can be more difficult to obtain, you know, from people who are like low income or specifically those in the criminal justice system. So I was wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that. Anyways, okay, so um, yeah, so there's a lot going on there. So straight to the point, um, no, there is not a lot of policy right now that goes on implementing care beyond the formal diagnosis. I think in fact, to, like to get 504 um, status and the accommodations that come with that and the accommodations under the IDEA Act, um, I think it actually requires a formal diagnosis um, as part of your 504 team. Um, so no, but there is a lot of evolving scholarship to make sure that the diagnosis that is there is, uh, increasingly accessible. Um, there's research that I found very interesting on um, like English as a second language education and how tests can be done um, to specifically diagnose and screen individuals um, in that community here in our education system. Um, there was also stuff on um, making it more accessible like economically, as you said, um, but no, unfortunately, and that's a field of scholarship I would love to see expanded. So thank you for the question. Do we have any other questions in the room or on Zoom? One question that was asked earlier um, that Dr. Whistler made note that might be of interest for you all um, that was asked of our previous panel was, um, and some of you did touch on this in your presentations, but you know, how did you come to select your topics? How did you, um, you know, kind of dive into this work and like what was it that brought you to, um, to select your topics? This is for all of you, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can touch on this first because for me, my topic had changed a lot from its inception, but I, I would say my biggest piece of advice is really talking to professors, like office hours are amazing, and for me, that was where a lot of the seeds of my project were initially determined. It didn't come out of nowhere. I had had a lot of conversations with, say, Professor Shiloh Krupar from the Culp Department, as well as Arjun Shankar, who had both been like very, very instrumental in finding this area of research. And even when you know Professor Krupar, I think once was like, "Hey, you should look at Afghan refugees." At first, I was like, "Ah, I don't know. I might look at some other things." And I talked to, say, Professor Giordano, and was looking at some stuff about the Anacostia in terms of urban development, and. Uh, after you know beginning that research, I actually came across more more work on Afghan refugees, and I was like, "Well, this has to be some sort of sign." So I went further with the Afghan refugee project, and even within that, I had a lot of changes in my research. Originally, it was going to be more quantitative. Then I realized the quantitative frame wouldn't really do it justice, so I decided to go through more of an interview process. So really, I would say like be flexible, trust your like instincts as well as your passions and it all does get figured out by the by the end. Um so how I sort of developed my project and selected my case study had to do um sort of there's kind of a there's a comparative approach to it um that fed into one another. So essentially I went home last winter break, and the clothing bank in my hometown, I am from a hometown of like about 600 people. Um, the clothing bank in my hometown that I had um, always, you know, like volunteered at, but also where a lot of my clothes had come from growing up, and a lot of my friends' clothes had come from growing up, um, they didn't have enough volunteers, and they had to shut their doors. And it used to be almost entirely staffed by just local kind of um, folks that were part of uh, different churches um, in our community. And so kind of with COVID and a lot of other sort of social factors, we, we couldn't staff that clothing bank. And so I was seeing in my hometown, in my home region, social withdrawal. I wanted to see sort of how that played out in a, 
in a more scholarly context, more evidence-based approach. And then that spring, the very following semester, um, I took a really wonderful class on African-American political theory with um, Dr. Terrence Johnson. And he sort of introduced me to a lot of this um, literature at, at sort of that intersection between political theory and theology of how um, what we believe informs what we do and how we um, show up in our communities. And so that's sort of how um, I began starting to ask some of the questions um, that I tried to in my project. Um, just to speak on my project a little bit, um, as I mentioned during my presentation, my the idea for my project actually came uh, quite a long time ago when I, um, after I finished my high school research paper, and if I'm being completely honest, this was a project that I was willing to pursue on my own time, and I was lucky to get funding and um, support from Georgetown and Laidlaw. And I think it's not that anthologies on Douglas don't exist already. They do, and um, they're quite wonderful. But they're also in book form, in very difficult, often scholarly language, and um, I wanted to create something that, I guess you could say in a way, is made by a student for students, and also online. I think even in my classrooms today, I try my best to find all my books online, and, and teachers also try their best to provide sources online. And I hoped that, you know, just like the ability to hit Command F, and the ability to just flick through it really quickly, um, in a way that's really um, accessible and also comfortable um, was the goal for my project, and um, I think it went pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and as I talked about in my presentation, a lot of my inspiration just came from lived experience. I um, actually got in the COVID hotel um, the week before like the proposal was due, so that actually kind of became a think tank of my own design, um, <laughs> and I did just a lot of work by computer. I knew I wanted to do dyslexia from my lived experience. I knew I wanted to do Texas from the same thing, um, so I ended up just researching what's going on in Texas and found um, a lot of exciting scholarship to dive into. I still remember actually like some of our initial advising sessions <laughs> when you're like, uh, so I'm in the COVID hotel and I can't come meet, but can we still talk about this? Yeah. So it's very, you did have this nice like little think tank operation happening in the, in the hotel room. So. Other questions from folks? It is helpful for folks who have hard of hearing. So. For sure. Um, I wanted to ask Renee about your theoretical framework. How did you, you mentioned that you read the memoirs on pauperism by Tocqueville. How did you develop that theoretical framework from reading um, that piece of literature? Um, okay, it's so kind of slightly nitty gritty on political theory for if you'll indulge me for a little bit. Um, basically, so Tocqueville's gonna write this memoir on pauperism, it's not his major work, it's not like his bestseller, it's not his greatest hit, his greatest hit is democracy in America. But you have this sort of like lesser known tune that he writes for the Society of Cherbourg um, called Memoir on Pauperism. First part of that memoir he's talking about like, hey, as we sort of have developed as a society, we're seeing um, poverty, grow and also empathy decrease. We're no longer recognizing the folks in our community um, that are experiencing poverty. We no longer feel this sort of old world idea of like noblesse oblige, where the rich have this duty to the poor. But we also don't have the system in place um, that's sort of like small d democratization to actually still have these structures of poverty. So that's part one of the memoir on pauperism. Part two, that's when he introduces religion. And he says, okay, the Catholics are and he, you know, query whether his, like, sort of theological understanding here is not somewhat polemic. Um, he's saying, okay, there's sort of this old school Catholic notion that's a lot closer to our sort of aristocratic world, noblesse oblige, but then there's this sort of, like, new Protestant thing where they're forming these systems and they're forming these sort of, like, committees to go help poor people. Um, and they're doing it as sort of this outcropping of faith. And so... Um, the part of my theoretical framework that memoir on pauperism really helped develop was that idea that fellowship organizes charity. Um, and then from that, some other 
um, some actually some really good sociology coming out of the University of Chicago um, from Elizabeth Clemens on civic gifts. Uh, she, her work on volunteerism was what uh, kind of fed into the other half of that. So, yeah, thank you. Do we have any qu other questions in the room or on Zoom? Oh, yeah. Um, I have a question for Kate and then for Dami later. But um, so, with your lived experience with like the Texas dyslexia like policy, did, was there anything like specifically negative or specifically like positive that pointed you in the direction to like researching what could change about policy or what could be added to what was already there? Yeah, yeah. So um, with my lived experience, um, I just kind of like um, so I came I came from a space of mainly positive feelings about these policies. Um, largely because they, they helped me um, be able to grow and become a Georgetown student um, from the education. So I have a lot of gratitude towards these policies um, and the people that made them. But I also recognize that um, clearly um, they're not doing the work to best like be accessible and effective for everyone. Um, so I'm, I was just very excited to form my positive experience and work towards how I could get positive experience for more and more people. Um, yeah. Um, and Dr. Whistler also, she was amazing. Um, whenever you do personal research on lived experience, I think it's really important to remember that like, it is your lived experience, right? And you can read like scary numbers or numbers that just might bring up different emotions. Um, so it's really important, something I learned, to have compassionate self-reflection um, and really just check in with yourself or doing that research. Um, so always, I love research lived experience. Just know that, you know, take care of your, yourself as you go through, and that's really important. I had another question for Damie. Um, I know you talked about accessibility, and I feel like that's what you might point to, but I was curious when you talked about how you tried to limit yourself to like two pages about for the um, the works. Was it challenging not to go from like a kind of like a proportional approach with like the longer maybe speeches or like um, written works of Frederick Douglass instead of instead of like doing a proportional approach and trying to do two pages for like all of the sources that you analyze? I just wanted to like hear your process and like maybe your um, thinking behind that. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the question. Um, I would say the most difficult part was one, selecting the sources themselves because there were so many to choose from. But definitely, yes. It was um, not easy to determine what excerpts I deem important. Kind of, you know, the, what right do I have to, to make that decision? But also, what scholarship finds important. And certainly there were some sources that already are much shorter than others, you know, some letters and such. And some of Douglas's speeches, honestly, are could be a whole pamphlet or a whole book. Um, and I actually consulted with Dr. Rothman as well as um, Dr. Tappet, who was actually my high school teacher, who teaches on Douglas still. And um, a good piece of advice that I received was to not only focus on what's quotable, um, you know, like if you're writing a research paper, but also um, what flows well, um, what metaphorical, um, like beautiful references to nature or to the Bible actually can matter. And so the bulk of my selections, I had to reference a lot of secondary reading, but also it was kind of about imagining myself as a student and saying, if I had read this book, his autobiography, for example, and then I had read this excerpt, would I think I'm missing something? And I think that was really the question that drove me through the selection and editing process. Thank you, everyone, um, all of our late law scholars who have joined us here today and presented their research. And thank you for all of us who have joined us um, for today's symposium.